Welcome back to your full crew. I am Don Zoldai, one of your co-hosts. And I'm Mike Peel, your other co-host. We've got some great articles today. We're going to be talking about Counter UAS Authority. We're going to be talking about AFWORK's new Autonomy Prime program. We're going to be talking about the Navy getting into 3D printing. And we're also going to be talking about the greatest AI lawsuit I've ever seen. And that's going to be coming up at the end. And we've got some great guests to talk about these things today. We're going to be starting with Lisa Elman. So Lisa, tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Thanks, Mike. Thanks so, so much for you and Don for having me. My name is Lisa Elman. I wear two hats. I work, um, I'm a partner and chair of the Global UAS Practice Group at Hogan Lovell's Law Firm, as well as I co-founded and now run as executive director an independent nonprofit, the Commercial Drone Alliance. So we focus on moving the commercial drone industry forward, working closely with federal policymakers and legislators, as well as focusing on uh, advanced air mobility more generally and uh, drone security as well. Great Thank you, Lisa. Listening. And we've also got today with us, Chris Lewis. So Chris, tell us a little bit about yourself. Excellent. Thanks for having me on today. Um, I'm Chris Lewis, I'm the founder of the nonprofit Vets to Drones program. So we train veterans to and prepare them to enter the commercial drone industry, uh, getting them part 107 qualified, getting some test flights going, uh, teaching them industry specific information as well, uh, just teaching them how to fly. Well, thank you for your service and also thank you for everything that you're doing now. Um, and also thank you, Lisa, for everything you're doing to push the commercial drone industry forward. Which brings us to your first article, which we've we've talked about a few times here, um, but it seems like they're they're it's it's finally getting discussed. So, tell us what's going on with Counter UAS Authority. Sure. So, it's actually it's interesting because you know we talk a lot about how from the commercial in in terms of opening up the commercial drone industry that policies have really lagged behind the technology. And that's true as well on the drone security side. And from a commercial drone alliance perspective, you know, we really see uh, drone, we see innovation and security as two sides of the same coin. In order to enable innovation, you have to have security. In order to have security, you have to be able to innovate. And so we have been watching carefully and closely the um, what's been going on on the Hill around, around drone security. It's actually gotten, less attention generally than than it probably should uh the preventing emerging threats act which initially you know uh it, it enabled dhs and doj to utilize counter drone technologies you know and just to take a step back here obviously drones have so many benefits and you know just from safety and security to sustainability and um so much more for the commercial marketplace but they can also be used for harm. And so, you know, the idea here is in order to enable the good, we also have to prevent the bad. And that's what the Preventing Emerging Threats Act did when it was enacted four years ago. Uh, earlier this year, and it was set to expire in October, it was expanded for a few months, and it's now set to expire again in about a month on December 16th. And so it's something that our whole community really should be, should be paying attention to right now. Um, we need to ensure that it, the, the, Preventing Emerging Threats Act, which, you know, uh, enables DHS and DOJ, if necessary, in certain situations to utilize counter drone technology, which includes detection technology, as well as mitigation technology in order to mitigate potential threats um, or to mitigate actual threats, uh, is able to uh, continue. And there have been a number, there have been different legislation that was moving through Congress on the Senate side, there was the Senator Peters legislation, which reflected what the administration wanted. The administration came out with a White House counter drone national action plan um, in the last several months, which would sought to move some of these, you know, not only extend the Preventing Emerging Threats Act, but also expand authorities in certain limited ways. Um, and as part of that, they made some legislative proposals including a limited counter drone pilot program with certain state and local law enforcement entities, 12 a year for five years, so 60 overall, as well as taking the common sense step of just enabling detection technology for a, you know um, critical infrastructure stakeholders. And uh, that's been you know kind of moved forward on the Senate side, but on the House side, there was 
different legislation that has gained momentum. Uh, the initial version of that legislation would actually have, you know, kind of pulled back some of the Preventing Emerging Threats Act uh, authorities. And I understand that there's been some work on that. And I think at this point, um, there's a push to simply extend the Preventing Emerging Threats Act and deal with the bigger issue of whether to expand uh, those authorities as part of the FAA reauthorization. So it's something that we've been watching very carefully and closely. And I think that the, the community has a broader interest, obviously, you know, if we take steps backward on the security side, that's not going to help the commercial side and vice versa. So, you know, it's certainly something that that we think needs um, needs attention. Chris, what are Absolutely. your thoughts? Yeah. That's very interesting. I, I like to know um, when it comes to counter drone technology, are they mainly focused on radio frequency jamming? Are you talking about physical deterrence? Um, what are the main technologies that they're focused on when talking about counter drone in general? So they focus on kind of, so, so the initial Preventing Emerging Threats Act, recognizing no one technology is appropriate for any, for, for a number of different environments, right? When you're on the military, like on the military side, you're kind of, you don't care necessarily as much about if you're trying to shoot down drones, like what the, you know, what it might look like kind of on the ground. Here, if you're, if you're operating counter drone technology over a huge stadium full of people, for example, you know, it's likely not appropriate to use a kinetic, you know, shoot a drone out of the sky. Um, it, but maybe you want to be able to use that type of technology where there aren't people around, right? So different technologies could be appropriate for different environments. And from, from our perspective, it's important just that the, the folks that are operationally leading these programs on the ground have have the ability to pick and choose the technology that's appropriate for the environment, whether it's jamming, whether it's uh, hacking into a drone, whether it's taking over, whether it's capturing it with a net or another drone, whether it's, you know, whatever, whatever the, the um, di different types of environments call for different types of technologies. And that's one of the areas that we think is important that it stay, the current version of the Preventing Emerging Threats Act gives, F, you know, DHS, DOJ, FAA, DOT, kind of the ability to work together and coordinate and figure out what are the right types of technologies to use given the operational needs. And from our perspective, that that flexibility is, is necessary. But I will say like the, the first version of the House legislation actually took out most of the types of tech. There's, there's been some privacy and civil liberties issues that have been raised by privacy groups. And so, they took out all of the, like, um, you know, exemptions to the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, the Pen Register Act, some of the exemptions for the surveillance type laws, and which would essentially lead leave only kinetic solutions. Um, and you know, arguments there have been, well, that's not it's not appropriate to cut down on the technologies that are available. But that said, I do think it's I do think that the industry, you know, it's interesting because. Six years ago or so, on the commercial drone side, there were there were similar privacy civil liberties concerns. Are we using drones to, you know, are, are drones being used to, to spy on people in their homes? Um, and the community came together and worked with the federal government and drafted a set of voluntary best practices. And you know, clearly that's not that wasn't like, you know, the um, that's not the point of use of drones. Like we're not seeking to violate people's privacy, but there were those concerns out there. And so um, the community came together, crafted some voluntary best practices, and those have been quite effective. And now um, in the common drone side, maybe it makes sense for the industry, you know, something that folks have talked about to get together and, and draft some best practices together, just like um, to ensure that, you know, drones can be used for good and they can be used for harm. Counter drone technology theoretically could be used for good and can be used for harm. So we want to make sure that these technologies are used for good as well, and are there steps that the private industry can take to educate folks and make sure that we're, you know, all on the same page about how these technologies are going to be used? Certainly, we don't think that, you know, counter drone equipment should be used to call First Amendment activities, for example. Like one of the fears is that counter drone technology would be used to, to um, shoot to shoot down, you know, a protesters, somebody that's protesting law enforcement, a drone that they're using to capture 
images of that activity. That's clearly not the point of the use of counter drone equipment. There are very real threats out there there um, that the equipment is meant for. Uh, and so, you know, maybe that's something that we should all work on together, but, but certainly in the short term, before, between now and December 16th, what we think is important is simply that the Preventing Emerging Threats Act at this point gets, gets renewed and that there's time to have that broader conversation as we think about in, ensuring that detection technology is enabled and ensuring that, you know, at some point we're able to move forward with a state or local pilot program given the limited resources of the federal government for these activities. Yeah, you know, Lisa, I, I watched the uh, hearing back in June, the, the Senate hearing uh, where we had DHS, FAA, um, and DOJ, uh, you know, all testifying. And what I sensed from the senators were was um, some frustration on a lack of data. So they've had these authorities for the last several years, but when, you know, Congress has asked, like, give us, you know, real numbers, right? I mean, the numbers we see are the ones we see in this article, like TSA spotted more than 2,000 drones around airports in the last year. Okay, but tell us more than that. And that's, I think without that information, I, you know, I think there's just a lack of, a fundamental lack of understanding of the technology, what it does. And like you said, Lisa, there's not one size fits all. Uh, you know, for example, Defend Solutions, you know, def, you know that Defend has a cyber solution, right? Um, you know, other people might have RF uh, solutions, you know, very specific ones, you know, like you said, there's kinetic others. So I think somebody needs to really, and I also feel like we really lost an opportunity in a way with the IPP, the Integration Pilot Program, and the Beyond Program, because the focus, like you said, has always been on that kind of innovation side, but that security side was never really, like, emphasized, I think, throughout Whereas both of those could have been working in tandem. I mean, we lost, you know, we lost that opportunity. I think there's still time for beyond because it's still clicking along. Uh, you know, you've got a couple, a handful of these pilot programs at airports like LA and, and things like this that Congress has, has authorized. But, um, you know, I think some missed opportunities here, a, la a fundamental lack of understanding of what the technology does and what information it collects. Uh, you know, I think that's where you get folks like the Electronic Frontier Foundation, the ACLU, like, oh, privacy, privacy, privacy. Well, you don't even know what it's doing. So yeah. how can you say it's scooping up all kinds of private data? If anything, you know, re remote ID, <laughs> I would think, uh, you know, would be a little more concerning than what some of these counter drone technology, and we know that's that's moving forward and it, as it needs to, uh, right? So th I think that's that's been my frustration is, just this fundamental lack of understanding, uh, getting the right information to the right people to appreciate what this, what these technologies do, why they're so important. And you're right, you're absolutely right, Lisa. By the way, everybody, Lisa was quoted in this Politico article at the very end. Um, you know, if this expires, it will set the whole industry back. Uh, you know, I mean, because we're talking about just a handful of federal agencies. Um, and I, you know, that Senate bill in particular, the one that expanded the authorities, it was very rational. It was very measured. It was like, okay, we'll train six local, state, local, whatever, you know, <laughs> agencies a year, which is nothing. And we'll run them through a DOJ, uh, DHS joint training school, <laughs> certify all the equipment. I mean, the hands-on for that uh, was just so reasonable. Uh, it wasn't like, oh, we're just going to give it to, you know, the Podunk County Sheriff and let them fire things out of the sky. Uh, so anyway, I know we're talking a lot about this, but Mike, what, what, are, your, what are your thoughts here? Um, well, I only have so much time because we do need to move on. But it, the biggest <laughs> thing for counter UAS for me is it seems there's like a gap in the type of authorities that could actually make a difference if there was a rogue drone versus... Uh, the ones that have the ability to uh, take it out. So, like, there's a huge kind of literal air gap between detection and uh, actually intervening with a rogue drone. Um, and I think that goes to what you were saying, Don, about it's kind of a lack of understanding of the technology. Um, also, on, on the privacy side, uh, 
Lisa's example that she brought up about, you know, interfering with somebody trying to record, let's say, police, um, that seems like a good example because, I mean, what would be better than not actually interfering in the actual physical uh, altercation? Um, that sometimes that's a concern for police officers. It's like, yes, you could have your free press, but you're in my way uh, type of thing. So the drone actually would be, um, that would be a great use for that there that would um, protect kind of all actors. Uh, I just think that, you know, time to be moving forward, time to be made aware of this. The technology, I think drone technology is sufficiently understood enough both on the regulation side and from the innovator side, like it's no longer pie in the sky. We know what our immediate goals are, our immediate steps are. I would say the same on regulation. We know what the next steps are. We just don't know the exact timeline. Uh, but I, I can't say that for counter drones. So I think uh, we, we need to uh, solidify things a little bit more. So hopefully this will help. All right, uh, we also, we've got some cool new autonomy stuff. Uh, AFWorks, which Chris is bringing to our attention. So the Air Force launches Autonomy Prime, uh, which is the sequel to their much beloved Agility Prime. So what is Autonomy Prime and why'd you bring it up, Chris? So yeah, uh, Air Force moving on to Autonomy Prime, which is uh, bring more autonomous functions to the technologies that uh, are pertain to the UAS industry. Uh, I think it ties to pretty closely into uh, the counter UAS system. If you take uncrewed traffic management and do account as well, um, the main functions I see happening with this autonomy prime program are allowing for uncrewed traffic management to happen on military installations. And if you have a fully controlled system where you're able to detect uh, uncrewed vehicles within a given radius or a given uh, sector, then you, you know and you have a detection system, you're able to, to tell the bad players versus the good players. Uh, with that, in conjunction with remote ID, you have a fully, uh, full uncrewed man traffic management uh, ecosystem, uh, preventing bad players from being in the sky. So uh, the Air Force has been fo fo focused on autonomy for a while now. They're moving on to larger aircraft now, uh, past uh, smaller UAVs, and um, there's more funding out there for companies out there looking or creating new autonomous functions, whether that's AI, machine learning, or uh, more autonomy, uh, autonomous technologies and uh, defense applications. So there's um, more funding coming out through the pipeline, which is always good to uh, move the program forward, uh, which um, is great news coming from the Agility Prime program. And uh, it's great to see the Air Force moving forward and bringing in new uh, types of technology that lead towards uncrewed traffic management and new types of uh, uncrewed technologies. So um, this has been a, based a lot off of uh, the, the, pro, the, the research that NASA and the FAA have been doing since 2013 uh, with the, the culmination of the uncrewed traffic management system in 2020. Um, it's a great segue into what's coming next, uh, which I believe it's very, uh, very important for the defense industry to uh, uh, take the helm and move this technology forward. Yeah, and they have been, which is, has been exciting, right? Like, uh, I had my doubts um, early on, but they really did uh, continue the investment in focus, and um, that's been kind of cool to see. Uh, Lisa, what's your take? I think it's great to see the investment and focus from DOD. I do think that we are in not just a global technology race around the world with other countries. I also think we're in a policy race. And so in addition to funding, which I am encouraged to see that DOD would be investing in some of these companies who are seeking, you know, U.S. companies who are trying to compete in the global marketplace. Um, I hope they're also working closely on the FAA regulatory side, simply because part of the challenge for companies that are trying to innovate in the space is, you know, yes, they're experiencing a lack of funding, but that generally beca is because of the regulatory frameworks which have lagged behind. And that was the whole reason behind the White House AAM summit back in August, on August 3rd. 
it was to bring all federal agencies together with stakeholders to talk about what the U.S. can do to maintain and expand our U.S. global aviation leadership. And, you know, clearly funding the next generation of aviation technology is critical, but so is enabling through regulations those technologies to be tested and improved and do research and development here in the United States. And so this is something when I, I testified to Congress a few months ago, uh, the Senate Commerce Committee is part of the first FA REOF hearing we talked about um, and included in our testimony that research and development needs to be more broadly enabled here in the U.S. and it can't be, it can't take years for companies to get an approval to be able to test their autonomous systems uh, for R&D because, you know, it's simply not conducive to moving U.S. innovation forward. So I think that in I, I, I think this sounds like a great program. I would, you know, also urge DOD to be working closely with the interagency to try to enable more of this activity for R&D here in the U.S. Yeah, I was going to say, um, I, I thought what was interesting about the RFI they put out is uh, their plans to create a, quote, purpose-built autonomy testing and development facility that they're going to be calling the AFWERX Proving Ground. Now, AFWERX has popped up a number of, let's just call them innovation hubs around the country. I saw one when I was down in Austin, Texas. Uh, there's one in Las Vegas, Nevada, and things like this. But to have the proving ground, I think, is pretty cool. But let's not forget, right, um, you know, from a policy standpoint, the Air Force and the Department of Defense have really kind of minimal interest really it, it's like a side interest in policy from a domestic standpoint. I mean, they're really about national security, winning and fighting the nation's wars. So they're more focused on what is this technology going to do on the battlefield? And um, so, you know, obviously what they do here in the United States is primarily, Chris can attest to this, with his Army and, and Marine background. You know, in the United States, what they're doing is basically training. Right. I mean, that that's what the, the military is supposed to be doing in the U.S. You don't want the military actually engaging. Uh, there's actually the Posse Comitatus Act. Right. They don't get engaged in law enforcement. They don't do any, you know, kind of domestic operations unless it's like no kidding homeland defense. I actually uh, talked you know, about that yesterday with somebody because, you know, they were concerned about military like overreach. I was like, actually, most military people are aware of this thing called the Posse Comitatus Act. Thank you, Don. Yeah. For, for teaching yeah, it's me it's about it. yeah. The military is very aware of their own authorities and what they're supposed to be doing in the homeland, and that's why we, you know, after 9/11, DHS was created, right? The Department of Homeland Security, which is a pretty huge, sprawling bureaucratic agency, is which, by the way, the United States Coast Guard has been rolled up under them since 2001 uh, or 2002, when when the uh, Homeland Security Act was passed. So. Um, Anyway, I, I think it's great that they're doing this too, uh, you know, but Lisa, to your point, um, for commercial entities that work with the military, uh, it's a huge stepping stone, I think, to certification for the FAA, in particular on the aviation side. You know, what we saw on Agility Prime is, and, and you know, it's really so interesting to me, you know, Joby toots their own horn quite a bit, but like beta technologies kind of flies a little bit under the radar. They were actually the first ones to get military certified uh, eVTOL, uh, you know, electric vertical takeoff and landing uh, without a lot of fanfare. But again, those, those certifications are stepping stones to eventual FAA certification. I think it gives those companies a really big leg up. Uh, so it's a win-win, what we call dual use technologies. Military is only gonna be working with you if they see some kind of end game for them on the battlefield, wouldn't you say? say that chris yeah absolutely um and i think the the struggles that have been happening in the past couple of years with uncrewed traffic management moving forward and the faa's uh regulatory barriers being up because of their safety concerns i think this allows for another uh realm to for this technology to be proven out and tested uh way more freely as well i mean if you're testing dod technology <clears throat> you're not like you were saying, you're not uh, adhering to the FAA necessarily, and you're preparing to send this to, to the battlefield. But if you're able to prove out this technology so that it can be used in a commercial manner, say for wildfire suppression efforts, which there's another uh, RFI out from NASA directing uh, the same exact uh, uh, type of technology, but controlling airspace in a different manner for a different use case. So if you're able to uh, have another funding source, another 
route towards uncrewed tra traffic management and full UAS autonomy, then uh, I think it's it's a great thing. So um, the more funding sources, the merrier when it comes to uh, <laughs> technology moving forward. I'll tell you that, especially here in the U.S. Yeah, and uh, uh, to your point, Chris, also developing the talent too, right? Absolutely. So when I think about Andrew Carter uh, from Resilience, like, you know, he's uh, – get which branch of the military he was in but he was former military and that's where he got his start with utm technology and you know they're an amazing firm that that pushes utm forward um so if you're creating environments for people like andrew carter to grow uh if they're getting funding if they're getting the, the ability to experiment and truly use their talent to its full extent uh, downstream that's good for America right so for me that a lot of this is just different lines of incentive right because we're um, you know our free market capitalist democratic society uh, Republic right uh, we have multiple modes to incentivize not only industry and and regulators um, to actually produce um, to compete on the world stage and it just seemed like for drones, we were only using one for a long time. And then we yeah. kind of switched more to the military side uh, to, I think, to the detriment of the um, the venture capital side. Uh, I'd like to see that come back a little bit, too. I know, like, they got a little bit past their skis, especially wanting everything to operate like software. But honestly, who puts pressure on the regulator more than, than business, right? Uh, or puts pressure through their representatives through lobbying and then the regulators have to move right so i think we do need some private industry to kind of come back and experiment and understand that hey the u.s is behind this technology because they see it as a, a main um kind of competitive vector that they need to succeed on on, on the global stage so if if you were, for example, Skydio five years ago when, or, or eight years ago when you raised capital, if you told your stakeholders that you were going to eventually be selling into the U.S. military at any point for any reason, they would have said, that's a pipe dream. But the truth is that that's not a pipe dream. You can create a commercial product in the drone space and be able to access one of the largest single purchasers in the world. So, um yeah, I, th I think this is just another great move, and I know AppWorks has a reputation uh, for good reason. They actually do produce. So, Michael, you touched on a good point um, with uh, the talent pool. Uh, it's another reason, you know, it gives me a chance to talk about Vesta Jones. It's another reason I started this organization because of the, the veterans out there that have thanks, <laughs> happy Veterans Day, Don, uh, that have these experiences and these, these skill sets they've used over the past 20 years in warfare over in Iraq and Afghanistan. We have JTACs and combat controllers and, and the like uh, who have controlled the airspace over a battlefield over the past 20 years in some form or fashion. And those skills are directly needed for uh, designing and, and co comprehending and understanding the, the use cases for say, natural disaster response and UTM during natural disaster response, uh, UTM for Agility Prime, of course, on military installations and off. So all that's another reason I created this program is to bring the, these skill sets out of the, you know, maybe they found a, a way in the commercial sector by becoming a pharmaceutical rep or, or selling cars or, you know, being fairly successful financially. But it's like you have these skills that we need know in this industry so it's another way to bring those skills back towards where they're needed the most um it's a shame when i meet a guy that's a, a j tech and he was over there for 12 years and it's like what are you doing now there's a nice suit nice cubicle come over here man i, I need you over here so it's, it's great to introduce him to this tech and, and get him back uh, uh where they feel at home you know yeah yeah absolutely so. and it's it's so it's a much easier transition right because if you spend oh, yeah. your you know a good portion of your early 20s uh, you know, focused on a specific task in the military and then there's no equatable task in the commercial sector when you come home, it's like starting from scratch. So any, anything that we could do to kind of create a pipeline between those two things actually just helps the, uh, not only innovation in general, but the literally national defense. So 
Uh, great article. Uh, thanks for, for bringing that up. And we're going to take a, just a short break to thank our sponsors. Um, we've got a new one, actually, Airspace Link. Uh, and you're going to be hearing more about that tomorrow. And Don will give you a little bit of a teaser at the end. Uh, we also have Drone Rescue Systems. Uh, Andreas Ployer was on our Full Tilt like two weeks ago. Amazing episode. Uh, promo Drone, Jamar Williams, which actually he's going to be making a return on Full Crew next week. So happy to see him again. And then Aiken Gump. Uh, so that's Jennifer Richter and team. Another great Full Tilt episode to take a look at. And you could also find Dawn on their Tech Talk uh podcast which will be coming up soon we'll be releasing a date at some point in the near future all right so don you're up what do we got here all right just kind of going with the veterans day theme a little bit uh so by the way thank you all to all of our veterans out there you you included of course chris um i i saw this article and i thought it was really interesting for a whole host of reasons so the United States Navy has, uh, for the very first time, actually installed a 3D printer that is capable of producing metal components on an amphibious ship. Uh, this thing weighs 4,700 pounds. It is six and a half feet tall, 68 inches front to back, and eight feet wide. So this thing is a monster that they put on this ship they also added by the way a polymer based printer that's only uh, a measly 100 pounds so they added two actually two 3d printers onto the ship to effectively maintain vessels while at sea now uh lots of things you know lots of parts go go south you know it's a harsh environment at sea uh maintaining vessels is a difficult thing what i thought was interesting about this well a lot of things about it uh, there's a lot of limiting factors. Number one, the size of this thing. You can't put this on every every possible military platform, <laughs> just given the size of it. The second thing is uh, that I found intriguing is some of the um, polymers uh, or some of the um, uh, powders, the metal power powders that they have to use to create this are actually very volt uh, volatile, and so you can't put them on ships. It could be dangerous. So so there's that. But the thing, because, you know, we dwell quite a bit in the in the uncrewed, uh, you know, aircraft system world, UAS world, there's been so many uh, drone companies kind of targeting this, let's just call it ship, ship to ship resupply uh, market, if you will, or ship to shore resupply market, um, that I, I wonder how ultimately once they perfect this 3D printing, maybe make it smaller, right, S the swap, the size, weight, and power, shrinks down like technology tends to do in a rapid fashion you know how's that going to play with these uh drone companies that have kind of built their whole model around this idea of being able to rapidly deploy parts for example like you would they would be creating with this 3d printer uh you know between between vessels so i mean i think it's really intriguing really cool it's a great use of 3d printing it makes a lot of sense It'll just be interesting to see whether it displaces some of these other advanced technologies that were targeting this, or there's maybe a good synergy. I don't know. I would love to hear Chris's thoughts about that. That's interesting. Yeah, I uh, hope hopefully they don't displace all of the uh, the ship to ship and the ship to shore work that's coming up. But um, maybe there could be a different model. You know, you have a hub uh, on one of the larger air carriers, uh, and you're printing everything you need there. If there's a ship pretty far out, then you can uh, have, have drone delivery systems have uh, as a hub and spoke model just out at sea. Um, oh, that I is think, brilliant, actually. I love that idea. <laughs> I, I think the more efficient and more uh, self-sufficient we are out that remote, uh, the better. So um, love that they're using 3D printing. I love 3D printing. Uh, I definitely did a bunch of projects like that when I was at university and uh, uh, played with all kinds of 3D printers, but um, it, it'd be interesting to see what parts they're creating as well with these massive metal 3D printers. Um, I mean, obviously as a ship, there's a lot of metal and equipment on there, but it'd be, it'd be really impressive to, or interesting to know what they, they need it for. Um, well, they, they were saying, um, you know, kind of the auxiliary parts for some larger systems, for example, exterior hand wheels. Uh, that get damaged okay. from repeat use or objects knocking yeah. into them was the example they gave. 
you know, valves as an example. Uh, I guess it takes days. <laughs> Uh, having been in the Air Force, I know how the procurement system works and how it takes a, a while to get things, but they're saying it takes days just to have a request fulfilled and then the items delivered to the ship, which maybe you don't have days, you know, to wait around if it's a significant part that, you know, that, that got damaged or something. But uh, Lisa, you know, there I also noticed in this article a little bit about workforce development, right? So here we are again. We're bringing this new technology uh, on board, literally on board, and it's like, all right, now we've got to train up some sailors to to be three D printers, you know. So I know you're very involved also with the Commercial Drone Alliance uh, on that workforce development side. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that, or or just kind of on this technology in general. Yeah, sure. I mean, we're seeing the same thing in the aviation side, right? Where you 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 used to have kind of the traditional aviation workforce and the tech workforce is kind of separate streams, uh, and now they're they're converging, and you have to be an expert at aviation, but you also have to be an expert at tech, and or you know, and so there's this whole new opportunity for all of these new jobs, where you're you know bringing kind of these different knowledge bases and different skill sets to bear, I think it's a great opportunity. I also think it's a great opportunity on the tech and sailing side or tech, you know, marine side. Um, I will say don't 3D printers also make drones? Um, yeah, they could. I, yeah. Yes, right? Make the drone to fly the part. I love it. <laughs> One stop exactly. shop. Exactly. And then there are drones that use 3D printers. So, you know, I think you could see lots of synergies. And we're seeing that across the, you know, across the drone industry as well, where you have lots of, you have different technologies. You know, I like to talk, you know, think about like, you know, when cell phones were first invented, do we have any idea that we'd be using them to do our banking and our emails and our, you know, to talk to, in addition to talking to our friends, but, and also our shopping and ordering our groceries on our cell phones, right? Who knows what the use cases for drones or 3D printers are going to be 10 years from now? We could be having the same conversation and it's literally all combined and the tech goes, you know, so it's really, really exciting just to see all of this evolve. Totally. I don't know how they wedge this thing onto that ship because, I mean, I, you know, I wasn't in the Navy, but I've toured a number of ships and that it, it's really close quarters already on there. I mean, they designed those ships to use every square inch of space, you know? Uh, so to put something that large on there, that's pretty significant, I think. Uh, Mike, what are you thinking? Well, just thinking uh, what you just said and ventilation, right? So yeah, true. So printers uh, give off some <laughs> noxious fumes. Um, I would imagine if a metal 3D printer would be worse on that front. Uh, but yeah, to go to what Chris was saying, it, it'll depend on which part right so this is probably um a stopgap for for parts that aren't easily uh acquired or take time um but there are there's limits to additive printing in general the types of shapes you could do uh that would probably be even more limited with metal because you can't shave things off there's additional work and then you have to worry about reliability because this thing was put together drop by drop rather than uh, being formed properly. Um, I'm kind of curious as to why they don't have subtractive presses or, or, or do they, uh, anything that could do like milling to create parts on these ships? Like why I did they- I don't know what they've got on there, Mike. I mean, <clears throat> they were talking about, uh, are using the, these occupational specialists, which would be relevant. I think to your question, machinist repairman, yeah, a whole technician and a damage stuff. controlman. So, <clears throat> so it, it, maybe they're just attacking the problem on a completely different plane and 3D printing is just the uh, the coolest new kind of toy. But I don't think it'll replace all the other things you were talking about because 3D printing does not create things in bulk. Subtractive you could get pretty fast, but uh, it takes, takes a minute to print something in 3D. Uh, so this is probably, you know, just to fill the gap for stuff that's kind of critical, but we don't want to wait any longer than we already are waiting to kind of fix. Um, so I think it'll just uh, embolden and uh, make the Navy just more more reliable. You know, good maintenance means you don't have to pay more later. 
pay a little bit now, a little work now. You don't have to take a catastrophic cost down the road. Uh, and clearly, the costs are very high when you're talking about uh, ships at this size. Any final thoughts on this, uh, Chris, Don? Yeah, I mean, at that point, yeah, I mean, the cost is, is not only the part itself, but getting the ship back to the shore or getting the part out to that ship. I mean, time loss, that, yeah. That's huge. So, so being able to print it out there or having the, the shore to ship or ship to ship delivery with drone, those two technologies combined, I mean, it's a perfect example of how Industry 4.0 can affect the DoD and I love it. I, I like the idea Chris also mentioned about this hub idea to have like a floating 3D printer where you could get close enough to land like to, uh, you know, kind of a ground based conflict and be flying the drones into that conflict for parts that they need, you know, your own ship aside and the maintenance of that ship, you know, what else is needed out there that that could be a really cool use as well right like so i could see a lot of different yeah, ways I, to slice this one i could easily see a future where that becomes a, an entire <laughs> class of vessel on its own right? yeah a mobile factory is it isn't there a chinese version of something like that a chinese <laughs> drone carrier there probably is i see some or, things in the chat mike i don't know if there's anything out there you wanted to comment on uh yeah so elizabeth pullen said ah come on man uh, ma'am. So I don't know <laughs> what she was referring to. Uh, uh, so, so she used to work for me. Hey, how are you doing? <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I asked her to provide more context, but maybe I was asking the wrong question. And then we got uh, Gabe Lopez, MBA, uh, saying absolutely correct. And vets bring the execution capability to those new skill sets required. So probably talking about our previous segment. Thanks, Gabe. And, uh, yeah, I guess we're all in agreement on that. Um, so final article. This one is mine. And I think this is uh, this is a mental shift uh, and an interesting one because I don't think there was a good uh, way to articulate what was happening in terms of AI algorithms essentially scraping the web and using that to synthesize their results. And this kind of really put it in plain language. There's a lawsuit uh, that could rewrite the rules of AI co copyright, according to this Verge article. Microsoft, GitHub, and OpenAI are, are under a class action lawsuit for violating copyright law. So one of the interesting things is this, uh, this tool called GitHub Copilot, which was trained on essentially GitHub data. Microsoft owns GitHub. And GitHub is where you post your code. One of the things that is common for programmers to do is to post their code with a license. Usually some type of open source license is not uncommon, but there's different variations of those. And some of those require simple attribution. Now, what this technology was doing was it was stealing those, or I don't want to actually use that word. It was scraping <laughs> the information there. It was synthesizing its result, but it was not providing attribution. And I think the case that's being made here that's pretty simple is look ai is not a black box somebody pointed it in that to on that target you know and they are aware of those licenses because they run that platform but they didn't seem to really care when they allowed this thing to execute and what was found to have happened was entire blocks of code because code is like math or logic right sometimes the way that something works you can't just like change it like you could summarize or paraphrase a paragraph um it has to operate that way so entire blocks of code were ac actually just popping up as suggested content in github uh, copilot uh without giving attribution to the original uh creator of that code so i think this also goes into kind of ai art stuff so if you post your stuff on Flickr and it has a, a creative commons license and it requires attribution but now you're seeing that that art is being used uh, quite clearly in the results of stable diffusion because it's mimicking you and uh, in some cases completely stealing entire uh, pixel arrangements. So this is a this is a big difference in where we were, I think, uh, where even my position would have been a couple years ago, thinking in terms of scraping the web and then synthesizing that uh, there was actually uh, another 
lawsuit. I think it was HiQ was the name of the company. It was sued by LinkedIn. LinkedIn was not owned by Microsoft at the time. That's just kind of a coincidence of history here. Uh, but LinkedIn su sued HiQ for scraping the publicly displayed profiles of users like us on LinkedIn and then using that to kind of sell information or, or, or insights to uh, clients. And HiQ won because that information was publicly displayed and there was no you know, youth, use authorization in the terms of service that they were violating. Uh, and essentially, it, we are kind of on the reverse side of this now where the information was scraped, it was publicly displayed, but um, the, violating the license is, is, is basically the, the tripwire here. And if we allow companies to just do that, what's the point of having a license on your code is what uh, the bringers of the lawsuit are saying. So we've got, Don, you want to take this one first? Well, I, I want to first, I, you know, look, uh, I'm a lawyer, but I'm not an you know, intellectual property lawyer, nor is Lisa. And Lisa works for a very large law firm that represents a lot of companies. So, you know, just kind of uh, in a protective manner, I'm going to say Lisa's not going to be commenting deeply on this particular class action lawsuit, um, you know, so we're, we're going to keep it kind of high level here uh, from the legal side, right? But um, first of all, th this thing was filed last Friday, so it's early. Uh, it's not yet been certified as a class, so they're going around looking for people that have been harmed. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> that's kind of where they are on this thing, but uh, the significance of this, uh, Mike, to your point, is that it is the very first class action case in the United States challenging the training and output of AI systems. So, you know, that could have ramifications across the board, you know, on other analogous systems. This is just one of many. Um, and so what I would like to know, Mike, maybe from you, or, or I don't know if Chris or Lisa are this savvy about open source code. Um, you know, I went to the PX4 Developer Summit uh, in June with Ramon Roche. Mike was there, of course. Uh, and I was walking around. It was part of a larger event, uh, you know, the Open Source Summit. And I saw all of these companies there, and I'm like, "How do you guys make money?" And they're they they call it uh, Mike. What's the term? Uh, it's like you 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 use our open source, but then there's like add-ons you can buy. Uh, mm, not sure what I, the, the term I forget that it, it was a it was a fun term, and now I can't remember. It doesn't matter. The point here is that these folks that have these licenses, even though it is open source, and I like this quote here. Uh, a person said in the article, attribution is a really big deal to me because that's how I get all my clients. Yeah, I make open source software. People use my packages. They see my name on it and then they contact me and I can sell them more engineering or support. If you take my attribution off, my career is over and I can't support my family. I can't live. So again, if you wonder how this works, you know, and that's why I was wandering around, like, how do you guys make money again? Uh, you know, it's, you know, the they we have this, <laughs> we put know, all this it's, free it's, content out there and then people hire us. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and people will sponsor, you know, our, our things and, and other things yes, we do. That also happens too, where you get sponsors yeah. for large open source projects like OBS, the software we're running right now is sponsored by Google. There you go. There you go. But it's open so, source. So, um, so I don't know, Chris, if you wanted to kind of comment on this. Um, sound, like, like Mike was saying, it was, sounds similar to uh, the music industry of like using, uh, what do you call it? Uh, Napster. Samples. Samples, yeah. samples from different musicians and then um, not giving them credit. Uh, if you don't give them credit, you're up for a lawsuit. So, um, you know, it's, I didn't know. It's interesting to see that this is the first time the AI has been used in this way. That's going to set some serious precedents and probably make it way more difficult to use AI in the future. So thanks for doing that. But um, yeah, there's definitely going to be some some legal ramifications for pulling the um, people's people's uh, open source data. I mean, there's no way that they, they can't have some kind of uh, ramification for this. So yeah, there seems to be like a like a clever rhetorical. I don't want to call it a trick because I know people in the valley that kind of like they get in the mindset of treating AI as 
I don't want to say sentient, but like at least a black box. Uh, that's the word the the article uses. But it, it's not that different than a conditional based algorithm, yeah. except that it it's coming to its formula without guidance, right? But that doesn't mean you didn't paint the target. So that's Absolutely. really what's what's going on here. You painted the target. You knew what you were scraping. Uh, so it's kind of like, you know, if you had, uh, you know, ADA technology in a car, but you had a human driver that's there to take the wheel in case there's an accident uh, or, you know, some type of uh, issue that might cause an accident. If if the the person that's supposed to be there in a music, uh, emergency doesn't grab the wheel, that person's liable. Uh, or the person that built the algorithm that failed is, is liable. The AI is not a thing on its own. And no. I, th I think this, we finally kind of found the, the barrier to that as, uh, a as we start to understand this technology a little bit better in the public sphere. A lot of artists are mad. So I think you'll find some artists out there that are even outside of the programming thing, which seems very, very easy to kind of nail down. Here is my MIT license. You violated it. Um, and the code is one for one. I think artists have a big claim too, because you steal, you see people stealing their their entire kind of um, aesthetic, and their stuff was not licensed for that use. So, where where did <laughs> where did they get the authority? They basically shot first, and they're asking for an apology later. Um, and you know, we'll we'll see how this goes. Like Don said, they have to find the people who are harmed. Uh, but well, I, I, you know, I, I, if you're on Twitter, I don't think you'll find any shortage of those people, to be honest. I, I just don't know how hard it would be um, to actually give attribution. Uh, now, maybe the hard part, and, and maybe Lisa can speak to this, maybe this is like job security for law firms that have really strong IP practices, because if you have to um, basically have somehow train the AI to read and understand the licenses or have attorneys interpret the licenses to say, look, all we got to do is pop their name up and then we're good. Give them credit for this code. That doesn't seem super hard. I think the hard part is what kind of license are we even talking about? Uh, I think that's where I don't even know if you can train a robot to figure all that out. It probably would be the lawyers in the background having to figure all of this out pretty routinely. No, well, it's 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 the input though, Don. So like, just think about it. They painted the target. The computer yeah. knows what it read. So mm. and, and the licensing stuff on GitHub, it's clearly there. You know, mm. all you have to do is train that another algorithm to recognize an MIT license because. It's the same license everywhere. Ah, I see. So, you know, there's a lot of standard licenses that are used. And GitHub could easily make this an opt-in thing. They didn't. They didn't want you to opt-in because they were afraid that they wouldn't be able to get the amount of data. So that's where we're at. Uh, so mm. it'll be a back and forth. Look, they're going to make the case for this technology and they need a big data set. And this technology is a huge and great advancement forward for people basically not having to code boilerplate crap. And uh, I think we could find a nice balance. But, you know, the people are, the people who make this stuff are now going to make their claim and they're going to have their day in court. So I think it's just, I, I'm excited because it's been like one, one-sided for a long time and I was totally fine with that one-sidedness. But uh, this really did change the game for a lot of creators. And if they don't have an incentive to create... These damn things won't have any stuff to consume and actually produce results with anyway. So the truth of the matter is they don't create code on their own. They are still using the human seeds of ideas to create this code. And if they don't want to acknowledge that, well, maybe they'll have to pay. So there's that. Any final words? Delisa, I don't know if you can say anything whatsoever, anything but a... uh, you're welcome to make any comments. Well, Hi, no, love. I didn't even, yeah, I didn't have a chance to even run this by folks. You know, I, like you said, I'm not, I'm not an IP expert. So I think what I would just, you know, my only uh, thought here is this is just another example of new and novel legal issues that are going to be raised by uses of these new technologies. And certainly not, this may be the first, but certainly not the last. 
um, lots of different legal issues, you know, in on the policy and regulatory side, as we see all of this continue, continue to move forward, um, you know, we'll see a lot more of that. So, you know, it's just fascinating to see all this evolve. Yeah. So I, I want to play devil's advocate for a second and sure. uh, see how much faster can folks write code now that there's a, a function that uh, uh, kind of guides you through the line. So if, if they're recommending different uh, stacks to you, if you're trying to build a certain project, it would, does it just make it that much easier and faster? So d does it work is what I'm saying. Does the AI work in actual function uh, the way it's supposed to? Yeah, it, it depends on who you ask, uh, you know, because yeah. sometimes also coders don't want to admit that it worked that well, right? There's there's that a little bit, but I in general, it it, yeah, exactly. It's like, oh, I, I could have done this faster myself, or it, I still had to tweak what it gave me so it was worthless. And I, I understand that, but um, in general, it's going to be helping some people, especially newbies, get to get past boilerplate code so that they're actually writing real functions, things that are, are making the difference and moving a code base forward. The other thing there is also cleanliness of code, uh, which we see it all the time and we don't even realize we're seeing the effects when you're like, why won't YouTube sign in right now and you're ready to throw the phone against the wall? That's like because some coder like left a hanging like, you know, like a, a, like a memory hole there that could just loop over itself. And... So yeah, I think it will we'll, we'll actually see the results in, in society. The thing is, again, it's just attribution, showing where it came from. You know, this has been kind of a, a crime of the web from the, the get-go, is that we can't properly attribute things, even with all these great records around. Um, and I think it's been, um, it's been kind of harmful. And I actually think with this exact technology that we're using it in this way, can be used to make attribution more accurate. Uh, and sure, sure. so we yeah. just got to change the dials a little bit. And, you know, maybe this is the wake up call for that. And I think that'll be great if we're able to give attribution to sources in ways that we weren't, maybe be able to <laughs> suss out inf misinformation from its origin a lot faster. You know, all of that, I think, uh, kind of starts here with actually wanting to attribute the source rather than claiming ownership uh, where there is none. So anyway, uh, we are coming up on time and we've got some great stuff coming up this week. If you like this content, we've got plenty more. And Dawn, you want to tell us what's going on? Yeah, just real quick. Tomorrow we have Anna Helander uh, from Airspace Link and uh, she's amazing. She's going to be talking about lifelong learning and servant leadership on the Full Tilt podcast tomorrow, 9 a.m. Mountain, 11 a.m. Eastern. So check us out uh talking to anna tomorrow and then uh wednesday on the dawn of drones we have the amazing uh, rex alexander five alpha uh world-renowned expert in heliports vertiports drone ports and so if you want to know about any one of those you would want to be dialing in on wednesday and drone life tv uh subscribe and check that out again 9 a.m Mountain 11 a.m. Eastern, and then on Thursday on our clubhouse 11 a.m. Uh, Mountain 1 p.m. Eastern, we've got Alan Ben Gal from the Unmanned uh, Network. Uh, he's out of Israel, but he's put together a really interesting collaborative group to help uh, the industry move forward and make connections. So check out what he's doing uh, Thursday, and he'll be on the Donna Jones next week. Next Monday, as you mentioned, Mike, uh, on the full crew, we have not only Jamar Williams uh, from Promo Drone, one of our sponsors, but also um, we've got a Jack Withen Withenshaw. Uh, he is the co-founder of Airspeeder. Talk about real flying cars. Uh, so that's going to be super fun having those two on the show next week as well. So we really appreciate Lisa and Chris being here today. Thank you so much. It was a great show. Thank you. Yep. And we would also like to thank our audience for participating today and helping the channel grow. Uh, you make it so Don and I get to do this uh, day after day. And we're very, very thankful for that. Again, thank you to our sponsors. And we are out here. Thank you.